Tonight's lecture, Canada, its own flag, its own destiny, will be delivered by our special guest, the Right Honourable Jean Chrétien. Nous sommes ravis d'accueillir à Concordia notre ancien premier ministre et son épouse Aline. As Canada's 20th Prime Minister from 1993 to 2003, Mr. Chrétien was a leader, not just in Canada, but on the world stage as well, where he formed warm relationships with leaders such as Bill Clinton, Jacques Chirac, and John Major. J'ai eu le plaisir de rencontrer M. Chrétien alors que Concordia lui remettait un doctorat honorifique en 2010, et nous sommes très heureux de l'accueillir à nouveau. Before I introduce our first speaker, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the, president, the presence of Concordia Distinguished Professor Emeritus, Henry Habib, for whom our speaker series is named. It's a delight to have you with us tonight, uh, Henry. As founder of our Department of Political Science, you have taught literally thousands of students. As a great Concordian, you have inspired far, far more. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of Concordia students, faculty, and staff, as well as former and current members of Concordia's Board of Governors, including our immediate past chair, Peter Kreit, as well as several parliamentarians who are with us tonight. Welcome. Tonight's turnout is impressive, so let's get started. It's my pleasure to introduce Associate Professor and Chair of Concordia's Department of Political Science to say a few words. Please welcome Marlene Sokolon. Bonsoir and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Department of Political Science, I would like to welcome you to the Henry P. Habib Distinguished Speaker Series on Peace, Conflict, and Global Politics in the 21st Century. This lecture series has welcomed a history of esteemed speakers. Previous luminaries have included Lloyd Axworthy, Raymond Chrétien, and Bob Ray. On behalf of the department, I would personally like to thank Professor Habib for his pivotal role in this, his namesake lecture series, and for instilling the spirit of inquiry in countless of students. Professor Habib established my department in 1961 at Loyola College, right, which was one of Concordia's founding institutions, and he remained chair of the department for an unprecedented 24 years. For decades, Professor Habib has dedicated himself to encouraging students to learn and think critically about Canadian, global, and international politics. We are very honored that he joins us this evening. Today, the Department of Political Science is home to 1,800 undergraduate, masters, and PhD students. Our alumni have gone on to prominent careers in politics, in all levels of the civil service, in academics, NGOs, think tanks, and the private sector. Their common bond is their expertise in a critical and evaluative thought, which is crucial to our democratic system. Tonight, it is also the department's great fortune to welcome the Right Honorable Jean Chrétien to share his views on Canada, a country dedicated to peace and prosperity. Thank you and good evening. Thank you, Marlene. It's now my distinct honor to introduce our keynote speaker, who will speak for about 15 minutes to be followed by a question and answer session. He served in numerous cabinet posts under Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau. Il est devenu chef de Parti libéral du Canada en 1990. Il a été assermenté à titre de 20e Premier ministre du Canada en 1993. He was re-elected with majorities in 1997 and in 2000, and Concordia has benefited from 18 Canada research chairs thanks to initiatives during his time in government. Among his many distinctions, he is a companion of the Order of Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Right Honourable Jean Chrétien. As we say in English, merci beaucoup.
you know, I'm surprised to be here tonight. <laughs> Professor Habib is a very tricky guy. <laughs> I was supposed to meet 30 students today. <laughs> I, of course, he used my daughter. Anyway, here I am, and I'm not used to big crowds like that. I don't know. You know, I'm in retirement since 11 years, so I don't know why you're still interested to hear me. <laughs> uh, but uh, your presentation, I was named by Mike Pearson. You know, I was elected under Mike Pearson in 1963. And uh, in 1965, we had a Canadian flag. It was a great day on Parliament Hill. It was cold, but it was very warm in our heart because we had our flag at long last. And uh, it was not easy. People would be surprised. We had the Union Jack on our flag since called it Red Ensign since Confederation. So that took months and months. Committee and you know, and uh, it was very difficult. So one day we had a vote on third reading. Et c'était une journée tout à fait exceptionnelle. C'était extrêmement tendu dans la Chambre des communes. Il y avait les libéraux qui votaient pour le nouveau drapeau, les NPD et les créditistes de Real Kawet, mais les conservateurs étaient très cons. Et je fais pas être politique là. Et quand on a eu voté, c'était très émouvant. And at the end of it, those who voted yes for the flag got up and sang "O Canada," and they were booed by others. After that, we I went to the fifth floor, you know, to take the elevator. The Minister of Public Works was George Michael Reit, older guy, and there was an incident with the person operating the elevator. And George said, don't give hell to this guy. I am his boss, give me hell, to a member of parliament who pushed old George Michael Reit. So it's the first time I used a Shawnian handshake. <laughs> and uh, I pushed the guy. And uh, we all went to have a coffee after that. But it was a day. And Mike Pearson, in my judgment, started a new phase in the history of Canada. I might call the emancipation of Canada. After the flag, the Royal Air Force became the Canadian Air Force. The Royal Navy became the Canadian Navy. I don't know what royals have come back, but apparently it's come back. I don't know why, but it's another problem. <laughs> but it was a great change. It was a great period of change. That was the period, you know, I like to see under the Canadian flag, the Maple Leaf flag. You know, it was Medicare. It was very important. It was a Canada pension plan. Under the Canadian Maple Leaf flag, the national anthem. Later on, under Trudeau and others, two official languages. The Charter of Rights and Freedom. All things that change the society very much. Immigration changed a lot. We used to have a lot of immigrants coming mostly from European nations. At that moment, we started to welcome people from Asia, from Latin America, from more from the Caribbean. And that is what made Canada what it is today an example of diversity in unity. And that was a Canada that I had the privilege to serve for 40 years as <laughs> member and minister and prime minister. <laughs> you know, part of
politics, people are cynical about it, and they think that there is no change with politicians. There's a lot of change with politicians. You know, we have developed an image of Canada internationally. You know, we became member of the G7 country. After that, you know, it was, you know, we, we under Pearson, of course, Mike Pearson was a great man. He got the Nobel Prize because he more or less, as the president of the Assembly of the United Nations, created the peacekeepers, the Blue Berets. You know, during that, it was a very difficult situation for Canada because our two mother nations, Great Britain and France, were at war with Egypt. And, you know, we intervened. In fact, we broke away from these two to be on the side of peace. And I was there at that time, not after that, but we are so proud of Mike Pearson. He's done it as Minister of Foreign Affairs. And when he was Prime Minister, when the time would come to have a seat on the Security Council, of course he had no problem. Under Trudeau, of course he had no problem. Under Moroni, he had no problem. And under me, it was kind of easy. <laughs> At that time, you know, Canada was seen in the world. Remember the file on the guy who wanted to kill apartheid in South Africa? He was supported by Trudeau. You know, Mr. Maroney was not my political persuasion, worked very hard on that. It was kind of difficult for him because Margaret Thatcher was on the other side. And apparently she was a very shy lady. <laughs> and, <laughs> And that, uh, so you no, know, but then after that, you know, I, I supported that too when I became prime minister. And I had the great honor to make him honorary citizen of Canada. And it was a, one of the great moments of my life. In fact, <laughs> in fact, in terms of emotion, it's when I presented the Montrealer. to Nelson Mandela. I was there with Oscar Peterson being introduced to Nelson Mandela. Both know about the other, and they were both emotional, and I was the witness. This is the kind of great moment you experience in public life. You know, so, at that time, you know, remember, people say things don't change. But I was kind of proud when I was prime minister, when the United Nations had a report every year on the quality of life in Canada. You know, we were always number one. At one time, we dropped number three, and the Globe and Mail gave me hell. <laughs> and now, apparently, we're number nine, 10, 11, I don't know, I don't want to know either. But for the people who say that politics does not matter, that matters a lot. You know, it was, uh, you know, Canada's change. But something happened at one time. Something happened a few years ago. You know, we did not win our enormous seat on the Security Council. It was kind of very sad for me. One day I was at United Nations, and I met a former president of Portugal with a former prime minister of Portugal who said to me, we never thought that we would defeat Canada for the seat of the United Nations. You know, it was a bit embarrassing, and uh, quite a lot. You know, we were the peacekeepers. And now we have become the target. So things change because of politics. 
You know, I was talking with a friend of mine who was a candidate in my writing earlier, he was in the audience, and he said, he reported to me that people are afraid in Shanglian these days. You know, that's very sad. They are afraid of terrorists in Shawnee. Come on. They have less chance, 10 times less of, ch of change, to be killed, be killed by a terrorist than to be killed by that, an eclair, lightning. <laughs> no, but it's the reality. And when you use fear, that is troublesome. I remember at September 11, 2001, when there was this great tragedy, the real terrorists invaded New York. Thousands died. Everybody was very scared. I had to decide what to do. I said that I would not scare anybody. That Friday, it was on a Monday, the Friday, there was a, a decision made by the governments around the globe, or not all of them, I don't know, that there would be a ceremony to honor the poor victims of the tragedy. I decided that we were not to go in hiding. Closets were not the way Canadians do things. On 100,000 Canadians came on the hill. I was watching the news that day on CNN. The screen was divided in two. On one side was a ceremony in Washington in a cathedral with the armed forces around, and probably the same thing in London and in Paris and in Rome and so on. The other side was 100 Canadian, 100,000 Canadian on the hill there. You know, because you have to keep in mind that Roosevelt said, the only thing we have to fear, to fear is fear itself. And it is a reality today to have amalgam. You know, there's 1.3 billion people who are Muslim, apparently, around the globe. You know, they, they're not all terrorists. Very small group. So for me, for the people who say that we cannot change things, you know, I feel we can. And what is happening for me, you know, I, I was elected in 1963. I referred to an incident that existed in 1965. And by the way, this member of parliament became a very good friend of mine after that, because Canada came together. We developed an image that was seen internationally as a very good one. That we were the reference for anybody. How can we have a society where you have a great diversity in unity, where you have two, and two official languages, where we're all equal despite of the language, the religions, and the color of the skin? You know what that means. One day, I was in the Middle East. You know, you saw what happened not long ago to the Minister of Foreign Affairs there. You know, for our time, the morning, I was decorated by Arafat on the Gaza Strip. Aline was with me. The same day, I received an honorary doctorate from the Hebraic University in Jerusalem. That was Canada of that day. So 
A lot of people are cynical about politics, mais je dois vous dire que la politique, comme je l'ai dit tantôt en anglais, ça fait de grandes différences. Et qu'on peut énerver le monde, ou on peut aussi les rassurer. Si vous êtes dans un avion, il va y avoir deux pilotes, vous me direz lequel vous préférez. Un peut vous dire, attachez vos ceintures, ça va brasser un peu, <rire> mais ça m'est déjà arrivé, puis on va passer à travers. Et l'autre vous dit, attachez vos ceintures, sortez votre chapelet, commencez à prier, je ne sais plus quoi faire. Je <rire> vais passer une loi spéciale, peut-être. <rire> Lequel des deux pilotes voulez-vous avoir? <rire> Alors, c'est ça. La vie politique, j'en ai fait pendant 40 ans. <rire> j'en ai eu des coups. J'en ai eu des coups. Ça... Seulement, je pense d'avoir bien servi mes concitoyens et d'avoir vécu dans une période excitante pour le Canada. Et pour moi, you know, I was so proud traveling as a Canadian when I was prime minister. I would go to Europe. They would have meetings of progressive governance. I remember one day in Berlin, all the leaders of Europe did not know what to do with immigration. They have problems with immigration in Europe. I was proud to tell them I don't have any problem with immigration in Canada. <laughs> oh, yes, I have a problem. I had promised 300,000 a year, and I had only 280,000 last year. Because for me, an immigrant is not a problem. I mean, an immigrant is an asset. <laughs> Most of the time, it's a very good deal. He's already educated. We don't have to pay for his education. <laughs> the first day he arrives, he's a consumer. He go to the grocery store, and after that, he buy a few furnitures, and after that, he buy a car and a house. After that, he buys he buy his bus. You no, know, he become an entrepreneur, and he's part of Canada with the diversity that we have. And it's why, all my life, I would say. You know, Canada is a great country. Millions and millions of people around the globe will give the last thing they have to become a Canadian citizen. Because we have been the example of diversity in unity, of tolerance, of sharing of acceptance of diversity, of modernity, of generosity. I spent 40 years working for that. And for me, Canada is still the best. Vive le Canada! Merci beaucoup. It's now my pleasure to introduce the moderator uh, for this uh, portion of the evening. She holds a bachelor's degree, an MBA, and an honorary doctorate from Concordia. She is the chief news anchor at CTV News Montreal and a great friend of Concordia. Please welcome Mitsumi Takahashi. Thank you, Bram. Good evening, everyone. Bonsoir. I know enough about performance to know that it's never a good idea to have to take the podium right after Jean Chrétien. <laughs> so I will keep this very, very short, just to say that I'm very, very much honored to be part of uh, tonight's Henry P. Habib Distinguished Speakers Series. And uh, I'm, I'm just so thrilled that so many of you turned out tonight. In the news, we're always worried that you know, people aren't interested in, in global politics. And 
obviously people are. So uh, Mr. Kachin is going to take a few questions from the audience after the conversation. And uh, first, I have a few questions myself. So we will get started. You know what I noticed? Um, when I saw the Globe and Mail and I saw that open letter, the open letter that you had signed with three other prime ministers. And I know that you've said in the past that if you speak out too many times, people are going to ignore you. So you only speak when it's important. So when I saw that letter, when you were talking about Bill C-51, the anti-terrorism bill, I realized it was very important to you. It was very important for you to say something about this bill, wasn't it? Yes, I wrote it, so you have only to read it. It was a great letter, <laughs> signed by a lot of people. No, it's important because in a democracy, freedom of speech, all the freedoms we have in the Charter of Rights, we take it for granted. But when you start to reduce it, you're on a path that is not recommended. You have to touch the freedoms when it's really needed. And you should not, and it's why me and my colleagues and others, judges and uh, uh, many others who signed this letter, all everybody were pretty serious people. You know, we've been through other things before. And uh, we've survived very much more difficult thing than that. And for me, you know, we should not play around too much with the freedom of people because you go in a path that is very dangerous and you have to be completely alert. And especially when the people get, live with fear, they acquiesce all the time. And, and this is the way that you dibble into a situation that is not healthy. You so it's why I said that when they asked me if I would participate in that, I said yes. It's the first time that I part. No, I did another time with uh, Joe Clark and Lloyd Axworthy and, and uh, broadband on the nuclear disarmament. You know, I left uh, 11 years ago, so I don't look like a mother in life. I speak twice in the public. <laughs> well. You notice, you mentioned in your speech that uh, you're less likely to get you know, struck by a terrorist than you would with lightning. In your opinion, what do you think is the greatest fear uh, or the greatest threat that's facing the world right now? What is the greatest threat? You know, we live in a very different world. Uh, I don't see the danger of a big war like we have known in 1939 and 1914, it's not in the card. The problem today is coming from what we see, terrorism, based on all sort of unusual nations, but it's not new. I remember uh, many years ago, in Italy, they had the Red Guards that were very bad. There was the gang of Baden, Baden in Germany. You had ERA in Northern Ireland. And I can go on and on. There was always some terrorism. So, it's, and it's always very difficult. This one is more complicated because what did not exist now exists is the communication. Well, you know, and what, they're using it very well. You know, they know, you know, they burn one soldiers. They put it on, on TV. Who oh, you? They not exist before. When they want publicity, they do something crazy and they're sure they will be in the home of everybody. 30 years ago, we were not faced with that. And honestly, it is a very challenging problem. But it's not the problem that is immediate for us here in Canada, in my judgment. You know, somebody came to my home to kill me one day. Yes. My wife saved my life. <laughs> she gave me an Eskimo carving. And if the poor guy had broken, he was dead. 
you know, but, but I, it was in the middle of the night, three o'clock in the night. I, you know, I went to work at eight o'clock, took the plane to go to Israel to go to the funeral of Rabin, who had been assassinated. He had been assassinated, had been missed. <laughs> but, you know, but now, but it's a reality. So I, I did not pass a special law because, you know, and uh, the poor guy was unfortunately sick and that he wanted to assassinate me the week after the referendum because we had won the referendum. So, you know, we live with that all the time. And I think that we have to keep things in perspective. But using fear, you know, like I'm informed a minute ago that now somebody will be, they're changing the law, you know, on people who are put in prison for life. So it would be for life for sure. You know, I'm not sure that is very wise when there's absolutely no hope at all in the life of somebody. I'm not sure. Some people who commit crimes can be rehabilitated. You know, I remember one day when I became the leader of my party, one gentleman was selected in his writing, and he had, I guess, did a hold up when he was a kid. And he had gone to jail. So the press wanted to know if I was to refuse him. I said, no, I take him. He paid his duty to the society. I'm telling you, he was one of the, my most solid members of parliament because he knew what was real life. So, you know, we have to be prudent, you know, with limiting the freedom of people and, and all that. You know, we had the system, the society, you know, works pretty well before today. Crime has gone down in Canada a lot in the last 20 years. That doesn't mean that there's not problem with crime, but it's better managed than it was, or there is less of that. We have to look at all the elements, but of course, a lot of people will applaud if you look tougher. I had to live with that all my life. Well, you know, I, I want to ask you about 2003. When you talk about things like keeping things in perspective, not trying to look tough unnecessarily, you chose not to follow the U.S. into a war into Iraq, and you say it was one of the most important moments in the history of Canada. I don't think I said that, but well, it's it was in true. your book. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I tend to be more modest than that. Okay. But, but it's, it's a quote I took, most important moment in our history. And, but, but it a was a big agree. important moment, I'll tell you why. But people agree it's, with you. It's because it was the first time that there was a war where the Americans and the Brits were involved and Canada was not there. First time. But it was not the reason that I wanted to be separate of the others. I think that George W. was wrong. That was why we said no. <laughs> and, and the mess in Iran was created by that. Everybody recognized that. You know, when you, you know, when you move, you have to look beyond the headlines. What will happen in 10 years? And you know, look at the great invasion of Libya. We went there, we bombed the place, and we went. Now all the armaments of Gaddafi are all in the end of the terrorists in Africa today. And Libya does not exist anymore. It was not the intention. They wanted to 
have a better regime in Libya. But it's a mess. So you have to think, you know, when in politics you have to think long term. And you have to, and don't work to be elected tomorrow. You know, I was not strong on polls. What you have to do is to do what you think is the right thing. That's it. And if people are not happy, they vote you out the next election and your wife is very happy. <laughs> I, uh, I want to ask you about this coming federal election in the fall. What do you think? What is at stake this fall? Well, I will vote liberal, no doubt about it. Don't. You know, and, and, yeah, and I would have fallen out of my chair if you'd said otherwise. But what and do you, you think? And you? Absolutely. I'm sitting here with you. Um, what do you think the ballot question will be? What do you think that is? What, what is at stake this fall? To have a better prime minister. And to have a liberal one, it's happiness. Oh, you know, I wish you'd come back, really. <laughs> maybe, maybe you could speak to your wife. <laughs> I don't want a divorce. <laughs> okay, uh, but no, no, she would support me, I know, but uh, 40 years in public life was enough. Don't well, the great think? story with, with your wife, I think, was you weren't planning to go for the third mandate because you had promised your wife that you I went for a third it. mandate. Well, yes, because she said four more years. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> so we got you thanks to her, so thank you very much for that. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm curious, though, in the fall, you know, a lot of people are speculating. What, what would happen if there was a minority government this fall? What do you think? But you will ask the leaders what would happen. And, of course, they will all say, I'm going for a majority government. And it will be... They have nothing else to do. So it's a completely hypothetical question. But the reality is after the election, the leaders will have to decide what to do. And because they will have been elected, and they will decide. So I had to think about it all the time because it was always a possibility for me that I could be in a minority government. And I had to say what I would do. So I never expected that the Reform Party was to support me. They were to the Tea Party of Canada of the day. So they were not to come to me. So I had always expected that the NDP were to support me. Of what was left of the NDP when I was the government because they were reduced to 6% of the vote. But, uh, you know, but it is the reality. You have to, you have to live with that. And, you know, it's, look at what happened in Ontario. The Liberal went into minority government with one seat missing. And, you know, and the NDP were supporting the Liberals and they got nervous and blah, blah, blah. And they defeated the Liberals and they paid the price. One thing that's historical that most of you don't know anything about it. Anybody knows Riyad Kawet in the audience here? Yeah, okay. Riyad Kawet was a great guy from near Shawinigan, La Caleta too. And he was the leader of the parti called the, the Creditis, Social Credit. So in 1972, uh, uh, the second election of Trudeau, we won the election with one seat. And for two years, we formed a government, always supported, not a coalition, but always supported in confident vote, because we needed them, otherwise we would have to be defeated, the NDP with David Lewis. So one day, David Lewis got up in the house and he said, I withdraw today, to the, tomorrow to the vote. I will withdraw my support of this government. So that meant an election. And Riyad Kawet from Rouen Arada got up. It was one of the most interesting speech I've heard in politics. Riyad said, because you know, I know Riyad, he was from Shawinigan, you know, like Camille Sanson, you know, <laughs> populist guy. So Riyad got up and he said this. He said, in 1963, 
And in 1962, I was having the balance of powers. I never caused the defeat of the government. I always tried to, to in 65, yeah, since 63 and 65, rather. I always supported, you know, the government on confident votes, but I would negotiate some changes in the budget and legislation in exchange of my support. That was my role. I had the balance of power. And I've exercised my duties as having the balance of power. You, the NDP, you 30 and one, less than 15 will come back. And later on, he said to David Lewis, and you, you will be defeated in your writing because you're running away from your responsibilities. And he was right on the money. David lost his seat, and I think he came back with 10 or 12 or 15 seats, something like that. So they would have to live with the reality. You, the press, would want to speculate. They cannot really speculate because they would face that reality after the election. And they're not to call an election the week after. Because in our system, if you cannot form a government, you know, the, the governor can call an election. So they will make the deal. What is the best? I don't know what will happen. They will negotiate if one of not the majority. But as I hope that you, all of you here, will let me to vote the same way than me, <laughs> so we will have a majority liberal government. And will not have to reply to this hypothetical question. <laughs> <laughs> I want to take you back to 1995 and the referendum in Quebec. And I've always admired your political instincts. But you said, looking back, that you underestimated the effect of Lucien Bouchard coming in because you thought that the fact that they were changing leaders meant that they were in trouble. And you misread that. Yes. Because I said, if they have to change the leaders in the middle of the campaign, it's because they are in deep trouble. And the poll were very that. I think the, uh, the, the yes was at 38, 39, perhaps 40%, and we were above 60, two, three weeks before the vote. Suddenly, they decide to name Lucien Bouchard the negotiator. So when they used the word negotiator, that meant there was no more separation. When you negotiate, it's not you don't negotiate a separation, you separate. You know, in divorce, they don't negotiate, they separate. <laughs> so, you know, so, and he became the negotiator for a better deal. And of course, you know, the question was so confusing. You know, it was, do you agree with the agreement passed between Bouchard, uh, Parizeau and uh, Dumont, and blah, 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 and a 90 word, something like that. I could, do you want to happiness? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it was difficult to vote no. <laughs> and, uh, and him, of course, he had been sick. He had a cane. And, and the people were telling that to God save his life to make Quebec independent. Some people will ask him to bless the Quebec flag. <laughs> it's difficult to fight against it. <laughs> and, and he had a vote of sympathy, plus all that. So I, I was surprised. But the question was, are you for motherhood and against sin? So you know, the question was not clear. And no, no, so after that, I said, this would not happen anymore. And we passed the law that we call the Clarity Act. So the question, there will be no negotiation according to this law if the question is not clear. Do you want to separate from Canada, yes or no? Because, you know, they, you know that's a reality. They were trying to hide. You know, I, they were giving me, sorry, I was to say hell, but it, well, yes. Because I was calling them separatists, you remember that? And check in the little Robert. <laughs> that is a French dictionary for the Anglo. <laughs> they gave the date 
when a word was used for the first time. The word independentist became a word in the dictionary in 1969, or something like that. The word sovereignties arrived in 1974 or 75, because they wanted to have another word to hide the truth. And remember, he said I was not speaking good French because I was using the word separatist. separatist. But one day I met Pierre Burgo, who was a real separatist. And he said, Chrétien, when you say that I'm a separatist, I don't mind, I'm a separatist. <laughs> I said, Burgo, when you call me a Modi federalist, I don't mind, <laughs> I am one of them. <laughs> so now the clear question would be there. And the British government consulted me on the referendum and they took our, me and others, but they had four or five minutes with them in London and here. And I said one thing, ask a clear question. They asked a clear question. Yes, they did. But they didn't ask for a clear majority. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I want a clear majority. And the NDP say that I'm not a Democrat, or the PQD say I'm not a Democrat, because I don't accept a vote of one. Because I believe that it would be kind of unfair if I wake up in the morning and somebody had forgot the glasses the night before and voted on the wrong line, and I don't have a country anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and talking about the NDP, they have a name that is illegal. Yes, on their advertising laws, and some in commerce would agree with me, you cannot have false advertising. And they call it themselves the New Democratic Party, and they are the New Democratic Party since 60 years. <laughs> so they came to that realization one time, and they wanted to change their name. And at their annual meeting, they couldn't do that. You know why? because they could not have two-thirds of the votes. <laughs> so much that I'm not a Democrat. <laughs> I am curious, do you think we will see another referendum? I mean, look at the Parti Québécois right now. The Parti Québécois is in a bit of a mess. Do you think we're gonna see another referendum? I don't know. I don't know, ask them, I'm not there. <laughs> I, um, no, I, I don't know. Next. Next. <laughs> I think you were, you were asked once, what were you best at at school? And you said street fighting. Would you repeat? <laughs> you were once asked, what were you best at at school? And you said you were best oh, at but street I fighting. Jokes. I know, but you never back away from a fight. I mean, if, if that's one thing about you, I think that everybody knows that you will never stand down on a fight that you think is, is, is worth no, no. fighting you know, for. You have to have convictions. Yeah. And now that you have conviction, you have to respect your own convictions. But sometimes you might be seen as being in the wrong, and you have to back down. But hey, I'm convinced that I'm right. Uh, no, you don't move me. <laughs> this I agree. On the other hand, tell us about the time that you faked an appendicitis attack to get out of school. Oh. Why to talk about it? Because it's a great story. Huh? <laughs> it's, it's a great true, story. It's true. I was in a boarding school, and I, <laughs> I hated they were boarding schools, so I faked an appendicite. <laughs> to get out to go home. And when I arrived there, my father suspected something. <laughs> I have a great culture, you know that. I was kicked out of four colleges in my house. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, but it, because I was too, too lively. <laughs> and that, uh, but that, you know, it's happened that my brother was a doctor and uh, anyway, 
Dio decided to operate me. And I don't have an appendicitis anymore. <laughs> We saw that um, your fighting spirit when you appeared before the Gomery Commission. And he called the golf balls that you had signed small town cheap. And you got mad. And you got even. And I think that was one of the I most did beautiful. I did not get mad. I got even. You know, you got even. <laughs> and it was, I think, one of the most beautiful you know, parts of television I've ever seen. You and the golf balls and the Gomery Commission. What can I say? <laughs> you know, the morning after in the Globe and Margaret Wendy wrote, this man has balls. <laughs> Next. <laughs> um, and this one is a little delicate because I have been doing my research on you. And it's, it's about your golf game. And this source said to me, ask him about his handicap because he's known to take liberties with the ball. Do you want to address that? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I play golf like others. I'm not a professional. You've played with Tiger Woods? Yeah, I did not beat him. No. <laughs> you might be able to now, though. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, you know, uh, sometimes a uh, lay in a golfer, sometimes you take a mulligan and uh, once in a while, and we do that. That happens. Happens. But, you know, when, <laughs> but you say um, that, that golf was a great way for you to get to know people, to talk to people. For, I don't know why, but you said you, you played golf in French on Saturdays and you played golf in English on Sundays. When I'm in Ottawa. Yeah, when you were in Ottawa. And Cheyenne is always in French. And you had some great times, for example, Bill Clinton. You golfed with Bill Clinton a lot. Many times. You want to bet with him? Hmm? You got his golf club? No, not me. Well, well actually, your... your uh, this is my grandson. Yeah, your grandson got the golf club. Yeah. You know, because uh, he drives a good ball, and he very, he's a good golfer. He, is a str he was strong, and he hit 240 and 250 and something like that. And I was with my grandson, Olivier. And that, uh, so Olivier drive a long ball. So we arrived there and, and Clinton said, uh, you know, if you beat me, Olivier, I would give you, me, give you this driver that Greg Norman gave to me. So, so I said, Olivier, concentrate, Olivier. <laughs> And Olivier hit close to 300 yards. So Clinton put a ball, 240. Another ball, 230. Another ball, 241. And Olivier said to me, Grandpapa, I gave him a bucket of ball. He lost his stick anyway. <laughs> so we have the clubs of Bill Clinton at the summer home of my daughter. <laughs> I want to go back to the, um, the sponsorship scandal, or the so-called scandal at the time, because people thought it was a really big deal at the time. And in hindsight, as the years go by, um, even I think Chantal Hébert said, you know, calling the commission was, was like an elephant panicking at the sight of a mouse, in, in retrospect, when it came about. But, you know, they had this commission. What is the reality about it? They spent $85 million on it. They discovered that they had been stolen five million bucks, <laughs> of which 2.5 was re reimbursed. Five guys went for j to jail. Four of them never had a card of the liberal member. They were business people. The one who was a liberal was a director of the party at that time. And he had, not, he had apparently stolen money, not from the government, but from the liberal party. And reputation was destroyed on that. You know, of course, you know, when you, are, you see that all the time, people, 
they want commission. The media love it. Because they can have a show every day, free of charge, paid by the government. <laughs> Remember, one of the commissioners said, now I'm well known, and when I go in a restaurant, I have a place, because they recognize me. But, you know, and what you do with that? You create the impression that the politicians are a bunch of crooks. And the people want to believe it. So not one member of my caucus, not one minister, had been accused of stealing $5 in all that. Checked. Not one staff member of any office had been accused of making $5 of that. And the reputation were destroyed. You know, we have policemen to grab those who steal money. But these commissions is a show. And the people watch it. And I'm telling you, I've been in politics all my life. 40 years. The other day I was talking with a member of parliament. I said, all this time, a guy who had been elected with me in 63, a guy who followed politics every day, and we had to scratch our head to find two or three members of parliament who have been found guilty of House of Commons, who have been found guilty of stealing money. And check. But the people want to believe. I used to say to, to, to members in the cabinet, I told them, I said, don't try to make money here. You won't make any money. Too many people watch you. You know, it's a big mistake. But if you're a good minister and you do a good job, don't worry. If you need a job, you will find one. That's my problem. You know, I'm 81 and I'm still working. <laughs> they, they don't want to accept my resignation <laughs> at Denton's because I have to advertise them. You know, I work for Denton's, a good law firm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, we're 3,000 lawyers around the globe on the west side. And we just joined 4,000 lawyers of China, Chinese lawyers, 7,000, apparently the biggest in the world. Good firm, go there. <laughs> because they pay me to work. <laughs> so okay. I said that, and it's unfair. And we destroyed the nobility of the job. I mentioned that earlier. Yep. You know, you do things when you're a prime minister. You did things when you were a member of parliament. Some people don't remember. Most of the people would not remember. I've done small things that give me a lot of satisfaction that nobody will know. Yeah. Well, I know that one of the things that you've, you always say is that the reason you sleep so well at night is that you don't watch the evening news. But one of the things that, that you have said, though, is during the time you were prime minister, the economy was good. There was job creation. Things were going well. And when yeah. things are going well, people like us get bored, right? So we come up with things like Peppergate and Shewinigate and, and your famous Shewinigan handshake. Yeah. Because, you know, it because you don't have real business to talk about. I know. That's the problem. I know. You know, but you know, we had a good time when I was there. Yes, you know, you I did. see the debate today, you know. And now apparently they might have a surplus soon. I read that. <laughs> you know, I, if I was there, I would tell them, wait a minute, guys. You come and you brag on your 11 surpluses. Because I had 10. We had 10 because two were after I left with the liberals. Well, you had 10 in a row. So now the, the press is all excited. We might have a surplus. Oh, come on. You know, it's nothing. We had 10 in a row. And they say the liberals were spenders. Good spenders we were. Or good collector, one of the two. So, come on, you have to put things in perspective. Yes, we were doing very well. You know, one of the great compliments I had when I left, the economist. The economist had on the cover a moose with rosé glasses. 
And the title was Canada is cool. <laughs> now they were right, Canada is cold. <laughs> you make a lot of, of your humble beginnings, and I think one of the things that struck me is you talk about how you were at a summit of world leaders, and you look around and you see yourself, Bill Clinton, John Major, Jacques Chirac, Boris Yeltsin, Helmut Kohl, all people who came from very humble beginnings. That's democracy, madam. Yeah, and there's a message there, isn't there? Because you talk about determination and how far you can go with determination. Yes, you know, everybody has a chance in life. Oh, you make your chance, but you have to be there when the change passed too. For me, my odds to become prime minister was I was a kid were not very big. You know, I, I got elected, could not speak English. When I arrived to, on the hill, virtually none. I made so many terrible, funny mistakes that I don't want to repeat here tonight. <laughs> and, you know, but I was there and I worked hard and I was lucky. I was there to pick up the lock when it was coming and so on. So you can do very well in Canada, you know, because the opportunities are there. Of course, there is only one prime minister. So if you don't run prime minister, don't feel that you miss your life. Because there's a lot of people miss their lives if they, it's the only goal you have in life. But you say that um, a life in politics is like skating on thin ice, you say. Yeah. And you never know when there will be a hole that will gobble you up and you will disappear forever. <laughs> and at the end of the day, you say to yourself, I survive one more day. And I survived 13,890 days, something like that. <laughs> but you've had, um, you've had some great people around you. There are certain names that come up all the time. Eddie Goldberg, Jean Pelche, John Ray. And you mention your wife. And what did you say? If you had known he was going to be prime minister, you wouldn't have married him. <laughs> That's right, because you were teenagers. Yeah, you know, but you know, we were from the, you know, the, you know, blue collar part of the town, and uh, you know, and it's it was a rough area, and uh, we would say we'll get out of here eventually, hopefully, and uh, we managed to, but. She knew me. She was 16 when I met her. I was 18. I know her since 62 years. We're married since six, 56 years. So one day people asked me. <laughs> one day, and she, she received so many phone calls after that. One day, <laughs> on a program like that, they asked me, what is your recipe? Oh, I said, see, it's simple. I said, you put water in your wine. She's not working, you gave her the glass of wine, and you drink the glass of water. Really? <laughs> and she's still with me, and I'm drinking water. You've always said, undersell yourself and overperform. That's what you've always done, right? Because a lot of people underestimated you at the beginning. You know, it, the, in politics, there is no miracle man. You know, you know, there is no genius. We're all human beings. And when you go in politics, and you promise and promise, you cannot deliver. So I had this notion that I will just say I will do my best. And one day I was trapped. Though. One of my opponents, I said, I will do my possible. I will do my possible. Alors, mon adversaire, dans un débat, a dit, Monsieur Chrétien a dit, je veux faire mon possible. Il dit toujours ça. Moi, je veux faire l'impossible. <laughs> Alors, j'étais vraiment mal pris. Alors, je dis, ce qui est impossible pour lui est facile pour moi. C'était pas de l'humilité, mais j'étais mal pris, il fallait que je donne une réponse. But, but you are very humble. Um, 
you were once, I remember when somebody asked you, how would you like to be remembered? And you said, I would like to be remembered as a competent minister. Me Prime Minister. Yes. <laughs> no, it's true. Competent. You know, you know, people will ask me that type of question. I said, I, I wanted to be a competent person, doing your job the best you can. At the end of the day, I would say to myself, I've done my best. And I would sleep well, because I would not listen to TV. Yes, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what advice do you give to people who are thinking of going into politics? What should they know going in? Oh, it's hard work, and it's a lot of fun. And it is, you never know, as I said earlier, that something will happen in your life and you make a mistake and you disappear. And the press will dump on you and the people will run away. It's very tough. You know, I've seen situations where I was sometimes in some difficult corner. And whoop, people would say, I remember one day I had, there was something unfair that had happened and uh, you know, I had no problem, but at the moment I had the bad headlines in the Globe, or, or probably the Gazette, or even more in the Devoir, and whatever. And I arrived at the, at the elevator. Because I had been the subject of bad publicity the day before, some guys, when they saw me there, walk rather than take the elevator. It's tough. I have one last question for you because it's just a, a great story and, and I just wanted you to, to tell it. Um, when you were thinking of running in, in 2000 and Fidel Castro came to Montreal and apparently he was the one who after speaking to Stockwell Day came to see you and said, go on, just call the election. It's a good story. Yes, but is it true? <laughs> but I don't remember. Oh, no. <laughs> but I met Fidel Castro here, and I, w I was the first visitor to Castro in 10 years. Uh, Canada, you know, I remember one day I was in New York, and uh, they were giving, at the Chamber of Commerce, or, and somebody said, uh, Prime Minister, you know, how come you have normal relation with Castro is a dictator. So I replied, yes, he's a dictator. I said, you Americans, for generation, you had very good relation with other bad dictators in all Latin America. For years, it was a situation. For me, those were right-wing dictators. This guy is a left-wing dictator, but for me, he's a dictator. <laughs> and I do business with him, but don't recognize uh, don't recognize, uh, reestablish re your relation with them too quickly. Because when you will do that, you will all be welcome in Canadian hotels. <laughs> the week after, the Chamber of Commerce of New York wrote to Clinton to ask to normalize the relation. <laughs> okay, then one last question, and then, then this one. Uh, you taking up snowboarding when you were 65 years old? Is that 65, true? 65, yes. And is and it true that you, you just did it for that one day? Yes. <laughs> because we journalists because didn't I bother to check. I hit the floor check. a few times. The problem <laughs> is I was 64, 364 days. <laughs> and I was with my grandchildren and they had a skateboard, skateboard. Uh, no, uh, snowboard. So I use it and I managed to get down a couple of times. It was difficult, but it turned out to be a good story. It was a great story. Because Donolo was working for me, uh, told that to the press. So nobody, the day after talk I was 65, they talk about I was snow, snowboarding. <laughs> and I did kiteboarding a, a year ago. A kite, uh, kite surfing. Wow. Okay. But, you know, I do that because I, like, I love sports. And I'm always challenged my, my grandchildren. Okay, I'm going to get to some of the questions. Uh, this is somebody who wants to know, 
How do you see the future for women politicians in Canada? They're, they're taking over. <laughs> you know, I, you know this, yesterday morning, I talked with the new uh, kids who work on the Hill, the uh, Bruce, what the, the page, the new page. I had about a dozen of them. Eleven were women, only one, girl, one boy. And they, they got these jobs in competition. So I said, oh my God. Good. I was very pleased that I was the one who had the greatest number of uh, women in my cabinet. And one day I was receiving a foreign leader and a governor general. And I told him this. The governor general was Adrian Clarkson. The chief justice was uh, Madame McLaughlin. So I said to the foreign leader, I said, this country is run by women. The governor general, the chief justice, and my wife. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's another question. What is the biggest political regret of your career? Whoa. I don't have any regrets too much. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, many things you don't do. I don't want to qualify them. I don't know. Depends one day. It might be a small thing that I have a regret. I've done my best. So, yes, I have some little thing that I should have done that I did not do and all big things. You know, but I don't want to classify them. I'm not spending time on that. Uh, next. Next. <laughs> What must Canada do to regain its status in world politics? Change the government. <laughs> so we're taking notes here. We vote liberal and we go see Denton if we have a problem. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. I am for the Clarity Act, you know that. <laughs> What should Canada do to encourage entrepreneurs? But we have, uh, you know, there is a lot of entrepreneurs in Canada. We're not short of entrepreneurs. Sometimes we could make it easier. I think that uh, the banks are not uh, open enough for that. They rather make big deals in the hundreds of millions of dollars than to invest in a brain of a young man. And the problem, too, is the system has become too bureaucratized in the banking system. Now, you know, they have, everything is decided by a computer. I know that. In the old days, when I became, um, my first time I went to the bank, I went to the bank, and I wanted to have money to build a house. And I didn't want to have a mortgage because I said I would pay it as quickly as possible. And I said, so I went to the banker and I said I have to borrow money. It was huge money, $15,000. And uh, I said I don't want a mortgage. I oh, really? No. I said I will pay you. The banker made a decision. He had the power at that time to make the decision. He said, okay, Jean, you know, I know you will pay me back. He could not do that today. He could not do that. He does not have the authority. I has to go to Toronto or New York <laughs> and a computer and so on to make a decision like that. You know, they will say, the, uh, we'll not name any name, but these guys don't pay their debt. This family pay their debt. So let's lend the money. Now they spend tons of money not to lend money. And this is uh, the last question because we're out of time. Who is your favorite foreign leader and why? Truman. Of the past. Mm -hmm. The actual I don't comment. <laughs> now because he was elected, you know, he never wanted to be president, never expected to be president. He was elected by kind of luck and he, he was selling clothing and, uh, and so on, and he found a little job, and he, he did it very professionally. And after that, 
somebody proposed him to run. He ran and he got elected. He was elected and he was not pretentious. And, uh, and uh, he was a very tough president. You know, when he was, he replaced, when he was surprised that when Roosevelt asked him to be his vice president, after the election, Roosevelt died quickly. He became the president. He was shocked, you know, and he became the president. And he didn't want to run to be elected. The polls were against him. Dewey was to walk with the, with the election. The Tulare went on the train, went across the United States. And everybody was shot, gave them hell, Harry. And he gave them hell. Everybody, you know, the big business, the big unions, they were having hell from Harry. And over the period of time, the people started to think about Harry. And the night of the election, you know, when the poor were coming, he went to sleep. And uh, the, the Chicago Tribune had a big headlines. You know, do we elect it? And when Harry got up in the morning, he read that, and he had won. So he lost, had a big smile. <laughs> the, the, the Chicago was, or was not for him, but the people were tribune, but he had won. And he made some very difficult, the, the bomb, atomic bombs, and so on. And the, you know, I, and, and when he finished, he drove back to Independence, Missouri. And he went back to his home. And in the home, he had his chair by the window, and he was not the boss. The mother-in-law was there. <laughs> so we, I admired him. Well, you know what? Thank you so much for this. And thank you so much for all your years of public service. Wonderful. Merci beaucoup. Bonsoir. Yeah.